Hello, my name is Shannon Raymer. I'm a registered nurse, and this is the total joint class for University of Maryland Medical System at Upper Chesapeake Health. Today we'll talk about getting ready for surgery, what to expect in the hospital, and discharge planning. To begin with, your new hip will be made in parts instead of all of one unit. A hip replacement consists of a metal shell with a polyethylene liner, a ball and a shaft, sometimes screws. A hip may be all metal or it could have a ceramic head. Your hip will be decided upon by your physician with your bone density and activity levels in mind. All hips have polyethylene liners. Advancements in these liners have made your hip last longer. Hip surgery is one of the most successful elective surgeries in the history of elective surgeries. After your hip surgery, you will want to carry a card that would let first responders know that you've had a hip replacement. I encourage you to keep this in your wallet along with your person to notify in your medication list. I frequently am asked, what about at the airport, now that you have uh, metal in your body? And I will tell you that even with the card, you will probably need to pass through the x-ray or have them do the wand, but you can let them know ahead of time of your joint replacement. Physicians often prefer the word resurfacing for knee replacements other than replacement. The reason is, we do not replace the entire knee, but rather we shave the ends of the long bone of the femur and the tibia, and we replace the ends of the surface with metal plating. There is a polyethylene liner in between the metal surfaces providing cushion. In your book, you'll see the x-ray of the knee and hip, so you'll have an idea of what they look like on x-ray. Again, the polyethylene liners and the new knees are longer lasting. They now tout 30-year knees, primarily because the polyethylene liners are able to withstand more time and are more durable and have less wear. Getting ready for surgery, most of your physicians have given you a list to take to your primary medical doctor. On this list, there are lab work and requirements. The lab work is to show us that you are healthy enough for surgery and is predetermined by the anesthesia department. We encourage your glucose levels to be within normal limits or below 200 the two weeks leading up to surgery. And your A1C, which is your three month blood sugar level for diabetics, should be below eight. Blood pressure should be controlled and your other kidney and liver function levels should be within normal limits. Dental clearance is not required prior to surgery, but dental health will be an important aspect of your new joint replacement. If you have any issues with your mouth, your gums, or the health of your teeth prior to surgery, you should seek your dentist or your orthodontist and be cleared. Infections in the mouth specifically can lead to infections in your new joint and you should not come into joint surgery with any infection in your mouth. After joint replacement you will be required to receive an antibiotic prior to any dental work. It is a preventative dose so just usually one or two doses will do and you will call your orthopedic surgeon leading into your first dental visit after your surgery. That will also apply to any invasive procedures. Any kind of surgery, the surgeon should be notified that you now have a new knee or hip and they can decide if you need prophylaxis prior to surgery. Your coach or care partner is an important person in this process. We know that as much work as we'll do with you ahead of time and while you're here with us, 
We will not be the person getting you out of the car when you first get home. We encourage your coach to come in for your physical therapy sessions so we can help educate them about the process as well. How to get you up and down the stairs and in and out of the car. These are all the important tasks that you'll have to go through to get home. While you are here in the hospital, you will go to the inpatient gym at 10.30 and 1.30 for our group physical therapy sessions. Group therapy is held with other joint replacement patients and not with any other population in the hospital. Your care partners are encouraged to come, have lunch with you in between, and often are able to take you home after your second session of therapy. Most of our joint replacement patients are only here for 24 hours. A few require 48 hours, and very infrequently do we have someone for more than 48 hours. I want to talk a little bit about preparing your home before you go home from your joint replacement surgery. Fall prevention is one of the most crucial things that we can go over prior to your surgery. We can stand you on your new joint replacement one hour after it's been placed. However, your soft tissue still needs to heal from surgery. With a little bit of blood loss and the pain medication, it's easier for you to lose balance and you are more of a fall risk for the first few days after surgery. Therefore, in the hospital, you will not get up without our assistance. And at home, we want someone with you for the first several days. And that includes getting up at night to go to the restroom. After those few crucial days, if you're doing well and stable on your feet, your family can return to work or their normal activities checking on you to assist with any big chores at your house, like grocery shopping, laundry, vacuuming, etc. To prevent falls at home, I would like you to do a walkthrough of your home. You should have room between your tables and your chairs and your couch for your walker. All throw rugs should be pulled up. Even throw rugs that do not slide, if you catch your toe or your walker on the corner, could trip you. Try to make things waist level and up. It isn't safe to try to bend over your walker to reach bottom drawers for your clothing or in the kitchen for your pots and pans. In your bedroom, if your bottom drawers contain clothing that you need every day, have them put out on top of your dresser or lay out outfits for yourself. In the kitchen, try to have some pots and pans that are easily accessible to you. They can be left on the stovetop or countertop so that you can easily reheat or heat your meals. Also, try to have meal plans ahead of time. If people will volunteer to help you and they're offering, let them make some lasagna or some easy quick meals that you can put in small containers and easily heat in the microwave. We do want you up walking every hour, trips to the kitchen, trips to the bathroom, but you will want to avoid hours in the kitchen with meal prep. For your comfort, I encourage you to have seating that is more compatible with your new joint replacement while you heal. Tall seats that are firm with armrests are going to be the easiest to get out of. Chairs that are low to the ground and very soft and pillowy will be more difficult. If your favorite chair sits low to the ground and is pillowy, try adding a firm pillow or a piece of foam. It will raise your height and make getting up from the chair much easier. You will need some equipment at discharge from the hospital. Some we will order for you and will be paid for by your insurance. Some you should consider ahead of time and you may have to purchase out of pocket. Everyone who leaves after a joint replacement goes home with a wheeled walker. Walkers are for stability. They allow us to have two hands on our assistive device so that we do not lose balance. Wheeled walkers are designed to push or glide so that we do not have to pick the walker up and march. 
but instead can walk in a step through gait in a heel toe pattern. We want to retrain your body to move correctly after your joint replacement. Walkers are paid for by insurances. We will have ordered them for you and have them delivered to you. Canes are usually used for steps. We use a rail in one hand and a cane in the other. And then as we transition from our walker, sometimes we utilize the cane as we recover. Canes are now considered over the counter and are usually not reimbursed by insurance. I encourage you to pick out a cane. It can have one prong or four prongs. It just requires a good rubber tip on the end so that it does not slip. All other equipment should be determined after surgery. Some people do require higher commodes for ease of getting up. Some may require a tub bench if they have a tub shower combination for safe and easy entry. And most other things like reachers and sock aids, I don't usually recommend that you go and If you need a tub bench for a shower tub combination, they can be bought outright or there are loaners from the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, and many churches. Most tub benches are not reimbursed by insurance. We do also have hip kits that are able to be purchased. Not all patients require them. They can assist with donning socks and getting your shoes on. They have long handled sponges and reachers. But again, I usually say wait and see after surgery once you've worked with occupational therapy. They will let you know if you need anything. The hip kit can be ordered and brought to your room from one of the local outpatient pharmacies, period. I would like to talk about packing for the hospital and what to bring. When you come to the hospital, you will want to dress like you're going to the gym. Clothes that are loose fitting and easy to pull up with elastic waistbands are the most easy. For knee replacements, shorts are often the best option. It allows us easy access to your knee for bandage changes. And the first 24 hours, your bandage can be bulky. You have a compression bandage, which is hard to get into the leg of some pants. For going home, shorts or sweatpants tend to work best for both knee and hip replacements. Again, they're loose fitting and easy to pull up and comfortable. I do ask that you bring a tennis shoe type shoe as we will be walking in the gym and in the hallway and you will want a good rubber soled shoe with a back. Any type of shirt that is comfortable is fine. You will want two changes of clothing. You may bring your overnight bag. Part of your occupational therapy is your morning routine. Occupational therapy are your activities of daily living. The therapist comes in and gets you up, gets you to the sink, helps you wash up and get dressed, and then meets you in the gym for car transfer and bathroom setup. They look at what we do every day and how our surgery affects those activities. The hospital does provide toothpaste and soap and toothbrush, but if you would like to bring your overnight bag, please do. You may also bring your cell phone and laptop if you like, but please remember there are no locked drawers in your room, so all items should be tucked away in a drawer when you go to the gym and the door to your room should be closed. If you have any valuable items that you feel you want to be placed in security, security can be called and will come to your room and lock the items in a safe and they can be brought back to you upon discharge or request. Please remember to bring your medication list to the hospital. Your medication list should have all medications taken, both regularly and as needed. It should have the name and dosage of the medication and the time of day that you take it. If you were required to stop medications before surgery, like blood thinners, please list the medication 
but next to it, put stop for the last day that it was taken. Any allergy should also be placed on this list, and anything that you would like to communicate with the anesthesiologist or pre-op staff. If you are easily nauseated by medications, please list that. If you have sleep apnea, please bring your machine with you. We will use your machine at night as you sleep. We will check the cords for any frayed endings, and you will need to know the settings on your machine. If you use an inhaler for asthma or COPD, please bring your inhalers both the morning of surgery and during your stay. We will usually keep them bedside for you. If you have any new medication, something that the doctor told you is a newer combination or a newer medicine, then I do encourage you to call and ask if we carry it or to bring it with you. We do have and supply you with most of the basic medications like blood pressure medications, medications for thyroid or for reflux or for hypertension or for hypercholesterolemia. One week before surgery, we will stop medications that could thin your blood. This includes aspirin, Plavix, and Coumadin, and it also includes some over-the-counter medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. That is the ibuprofen family of medicines like ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen. Also, over-the-counter medications can have different combinations and aren't always tested by the FDA. So unless it is something that you feel that you really need and then I encourage you to call and check, please stop all over-the-counter medications except for your vitamins. There are some newer blood thinners like Xarelto, Prodaxa, and Eliquis that are stopped closer to your surgery date, usually 48 hours prior. If you have any questions on what to stop or which medications to take the morning of surgery, I highly encourage you to call your primary medical doctor or talk to our pre-surgical testing nurse before surgery. All patients are contacted by the pre-surgical testing nurse within a few days of surgery to go over what to take the morning of surgery and so we can obtain your medication list. The night before surgery, you will be in PO. What that means for you is you will have nothing to eat or drink after midnight. Prior to midnight, I do encourage you to have a high carbohydrate dinner. Some type of pasta is usually encouraged and a Gatorade, one whole Gatorade beginning at 10 p.m. and done before you go to bed. After that, you will have nothing to eat or drink except for the medications that your primary doctor or pre-surgical testing nurse have told you to take with a sip of water. You will do a pre-surgical scrub. Everyone has skin bacteria on their skin. There are resistant strains that we test for prior to surgery. What we would like to do is decrease the amount of bacteria on your skin before surgery to decrease the risk of infection. The infection rate for joint replacement is less than 1%, but the precautions that we take ahead of time help ensure a safe and effective recovery. We will give you Hibiclin soap, or it can be purchased over the counter at the pharmacy. Hibiclins is an antimicrobial alcohol-based soap. It is somewhat drying, but I do ask that you do not put lotions or creams on your skin after using your soap. If you have a history of skin infections, I encourage you to let your doctor know. We will do five baths with your soap and provide you with an ointment for your nose. If you have no history of skin infection, we encourage two baths or showers with your Hibiclin soap. When you take your shower, you should wash your hair with your regular shampoo, wash your face with your regular face soap, and use your Hibiclins from the neck down. 
Again, HibaCleanse is drying and alcohol based and we do not want to get it in your eyes. It does not suds and is thin so it spreads far. HibaCleanse should not be used on your face as it has an alcohol base and we do not want it to get into your eye. Please pour the HibaCleanse into your hand or clean washcloth and start to wash from the neck down. You are to cover all surfaces and spend the most time on your surgical leg or legs. Get behind the knee and on the inside of the thigh. Once you have spread the HibaCleanse over the surface of your body, please step back from the water and let it sit on your skin for two minutes. Then you may rinse off. Once you have done your HibaCleanse shower, please get into clean pajamas and into clean sheets as we do not want you to get into the same dead skin cells. The morning of surgery, you would do your second HibaCleanse shower. You do not have to wash your hair again, but we do want you to use the HibaCleanse from the neck down, again letting it sit on your skin for two minutes and then rinsing off. You may use deodorant the morning of your surgery, but no other powders, creams, or lotions should be placed on your skin. Please do not wear jewelry as you come in for surgery, as we do not want any metal on your body. We do use an electrical pen called a bovi while we do the surgery. If you have any change in your health condition before surgery, please let us know. If you think you are running a fever or have a productive cough or any infection on your skin, you need to call your physician or orthopedic surgeon prior to surgery. What to expect while you're in the hospital? The day of your surgery, if your surgery is at Harper Memorial Hospital, you will want to come to the main entrance and bear to the right to register. They will get you registered and walk you back to the preoperative area. At Upper Chesapeake, you will want to come to the Klein Ambulatory Care Building. As you walk through the front doors at ground level, you will see an elevator to your left and stairs to your right. Straight ahead is pre-surgical registration. As you come through the doors, you will walk straight back into the surgical registration area. We will get you into the back and into your patient gown and start your IV in the admission process. Once you are in your gown and your IV is in, care partners are again allowed back with the patient until the time of surgery. While you are in the pre-surgical area, your orthopedic surgeon will come in to consent you for surgery. He will write on your operative leg, yes, and put his initials. The anesthesiologist will come in and go over the options for anesthesia. He will also consent you. Once you are consented for surgery, you can have something to relax if you feel that you need it. All patients are numbed prior to surgery. This allows us to use a lighter version of anesthetic instead of general anesthesia. General anesthesia will sedate a person until they are unconscious and then they will sleep through surgery. Often, if we can numb the area that we're doing surgery on with a block, it enables us to give you a lighter sedation which is easier to wake from and has less side effect. The other benefit of a block is that when you wake, your area of surgery is still comfortable and we have time to sit you up and give you something to eat and drink and get medications on board before you have to stand and move around. Most patients can stand an hour after surgery, but usually your first physical therapy session will be several hours after surgery. Either the therapist or your nurse will stand you, make sure that your legs are stable and get you to your bedside chair. Again, many patients the next day after both sessions of therapy will go home. Your surgery will usually last 45 minutes to an hour, but you will be in the OR longer than that. This allows for the numbing and the anesthesia and for timeouts and counts 
and for you to be moved onto your hospital bed prior to your physician coming out to talk to your family. I would advise your family not to look for the physician for an hour and a half to two hours after they see you go to the OR. There, there is a board in both waiting rooms that indicates your physician name and whether he is in the OR or has come out. That would allow your family to follow and have an idea of when to expect the physician. Usually, once your family leave you, there is time to go and get coffee or a snack before they need to come back and sit and wait for the physician. We do like your family to be there to come out and let them know about your successful surgery and to update them on your status. Once you're awake, your family will be allowed to come back into the recovery room with you and then to go to your room after surgery. You will be in the recovery room or post-anesthesia care unit, PACU, for two hours or more. The first two hours, the nurse will make sure your vital signs are stable, that you aren't nauseated, your pain is controlled. Often you will sit up and drink and possibly eat while you're there before you go to your room. I do encourage all patients to eat after surgery. Once your surgery is done, your gut is working, as our surgery is not done around your stomach, and I encourage you to put food on your stomach to help protect it from the medications you're given after surgery. The way that we order food at Upper Chesapeake and Hartford Memorial is you are given a food menu. That menu contains breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you can order any time until 6 p.m and the food is brought in 30 to 40 minutes. You will want to eat small frequent meals after your surgery and always eat prior to receiving your pain medication as it can nauseate you on an empty stomach. Once you are done in the post anesthesia care unit and brought to your room, you will get up to your chair and to the bathroom with assist of staff. Again, we asked you not to get up by yourself, but to put your call light on and let us assist you while you're with us. We use a pain scale at the hospital designed to let the nurse know the severity of your pain and how well our medications work to treat it. It is a zero to 10 scale where zero is no pain and 10 is the worst pain. At rest, we expect your pain to be four or less, as you will not rest well or heal well if your pain is not controlled at rest. While we are in the gym and doing our physical therapy, your pain scores will usually elevate. With knee replacements especially, we do often see pain scores of six to eight as we bend the knee or go through the physical therapy exercises. Please know that this is normal and we will work through it and it gets better every day. We never like to see pain scores of 10. Any time that we see that, it lets us know that we need to work to change our medications and get your pain more under control. Everyone is different with pain control. Some require less medication, some require more, but we need to find the combination that works best for you to send you home with after your surgery. Usually as we give you pain medication, we try to use a multimodal approach. What that means is we don't just use one type of medication, but several different types to achieve pain control. I mentioned earlier that your physician may use a block or numbing medication in the area of your surgery to help with comfort for the first 12 to 24 hours. We also use Tylenol and we use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories when the patient is able to have them. Narcotics are used for moderate to severe pain as needed. You may go home with a prescription for a narcotic if you are using one in the hospital. Narcotics can cause itching, constipation, nausea, and a feeling of being sleepy. That does not mean you have an allergy or a bad reaction, but rather it is the side effect of many opioid medications. We do want to limit the side effects 
and also only use opioids when necessary. If you find that your itching has become severe or is accompanied by a rash, please let us know so that we can change your medication. I do encourage everyone to have something at home for constipation. It is one of the most frequent complaints after surgery. Having something at home that is a stool softener with laxative combination is usually your best bet. That will allow for you to stay regular and comfortable. You can start your stool softener two days prior to surgery. We also use other means of pain control and comfort control after surgery. One of those is ice. Ice therapy or cryotherapy has been shown to decrease pain scores and decrease swelling after surgery. For knee replacement surgery, we use a cryo cuff, which looks like a cooler that would pump cold water around the knee after surgery. You will go home with this device and we will show you how to utilize it. For hip replacement surgery, we use cold packs, ice packs, uh, and gel packs after surgery to help with swelling and comfort. Again, you will go home with these packs and you will utilize them at home to keep yourself comfortable after surgery. While you're in the hospital, we are goal oriented. We want you to be able to walk greater than 100 feet, get in and out of our practice car, get yourself dressed into the bathroom, and if you have stairs to enter the house, then we will practice stairs to make sure that you can do them safely to get home. If you are able to stay on the first level, then you may do that for a day or two while the therapist works with you at home. If you cannot stay on the first level, then again, let our staff know so we can practice stairs before you go home to make sure you can get up to your bedroom safely with your care partner walking beside you. You will have precautions given to you in how you move safely to protect your new joint. Even though the bone is safe to stand an hour after surgery, the soft tissue that we have to cut through to get to the bone needs to heal. Like a bad bruise for two to three weeks, you need to protect this area to allow for healing. For a hip replacement, there are certain movements that are determined by the type of hip replacement that you have had. If you have had a posterior hip replacement, which would be an incision in the back, you will not be able to bend more than 90 degrees. You will not cross your legs and you will sleep with a pillow between your legs for the first month after surgery. If you've had an anterior hip replacement, which would mean an incision in the front or the front and slightly to the side, you will not take any exaggerated steps backwards. That doesn't mean you may not step backwards, but you would not kick your leg out backwards and you will not sit in a figure four position. What that means is if you're putting your shoes and socks on, you will not pull your foot up towards your lap to put your shoes and socks on, but rather we will teach you to bend forward to apply your shoes and socks. For both knees and hip replacements, we discourage twisting and we want to minimize the rotation. What that means is your knees, hips, and shoulders should be pointing the same direction as you walk. If the telephone rings, don't plant your surgical leg and twist your body around to pick it up. Instead, we will show you to pick up your feet, slowly turn, keeping your body in alignment to walk back to get to the phone. Again, this is for a short period of time while we allow for the soft tissue to heal. Think of your tendons and ligaments as rubber bands. When we twist, we pull those rubber bands and we're allowing them to heal after surgery when our joint replacement may be inflamed and sore. Also for knee replacements, when you are ready to kneel on your new knee replacement, you will want a pillow under the knee to protect your new joint replacement. You will not want to kneel on a hard surface like cement or tile, but rather a softer surface or put a pillow down or a gardener's pad or a yoga pad to kneel on the knee. The first several months after a knee replacement 
It is uncomfortable to kneel on your new knee as there is scar tissue. After several months, you may again get onto your knee for activities, physical activities like yoga, for work activities like changing of oil, or for recreational activities. But I do encourage you again to put some soft padding under the knee when you kneel on it. And usually you will work up in time, starting in 10 minute increments and working up to longer periods of time where you can kneel on your new knee. I do think it's important to mention if you were to fall at home, the way that you would get up would be to roll onto your hands and knees, crawl to a surface that will not pull over like a couch or a counter and pull yourself up. It is not comfortable after joint replacement surgery to do so, but it is usually the only safe way to get up if you have fallen down. If you do take a spill the first few weeks after surgery, please call your physician and let them know as they may want to x-ray your knee or hip to make sure that no damage is done. I mentioned that after surgery, many patients complain of constipation as a side effect. The other side effect that I hear complained of the most is swelling to your new hip or knee. It probably will not come as a surprise that you will have swelling to your new near hip the first two weeks. The swelling generally increases after you leave the hospital, peaks the end of the first week, and into the middle to end of the second week post-op, the swelling goes down and you regain more and more mobility in your new near hip. Some swelling is normal. When we've had surgery, our body creates inflammation in the area of the surgery to help heal. Inflammation is not the same thing as infection. Inflammation is how the body floods the area with blood and nutrients to help with the healing process. There may be some warmth and some swelling afterwards. Excessive warmth and swelling, however, can mean signs of infection or prohibit healing. So how do we help with the swelling? We will use the acronym RICE. Rest, ice, compress, and elevate. This can also be found in your booklet. We will rest frequently during the day. That doesn't mean that I want you to sit all day or to lie down all day. Just the opposite. I would like you to get up every hour during the day. Take small trips to the bathroom, to the bedroom, to the kitchen or bath. Stretch your legs so that you do not get blood clots. It also helps prevent pneumonia and urinary tract infections. Frequent activity is encouraged. Excessive activity is not. Use the guidance of your therapist. Doing more activity than you have been asked to do does not help you heal faster, but can have the opposite effect. In between these short walks and movements, you may go back and either sit and watch TV with your legs down, or at least four to six times a day, I would like you to rest, ice, compress, and elevate, which you will do lying on the couch or your bed. When you are doing your rice and are resting, you need to lay on a flat surface. You will use your ice, either your ice machine or your ice packs to help with comfort and swelling. You will use compression devices that we will give you or provide you in the hospital that help with circulation, and you will elevate your leg. Elevation is frequently what is missed in this combination. And unless your heel is higher than your heart, your leg is not truly elevated. And when your leg is not elevated, it will continue to swell. Please, when you are elevating your leg, use pillows under your heel if you have had a knee replacement, we never put pillows under the knee for elevation. Pillows are only under your knee when we are doing your exercises. If we rest with pillows under our knee too frequently, we end up with contractures and we are not able to straighten our leg adequately. You will be at higher risk for blood clots after you've had a joint replacement. It's not seen frequently, but it is something that we want to prevent. Your physician will provide you with a chemical prophylaxis, which usually means a pill or an injection that help defend the blood after surgery. 
If you have been on anticoagulation before surgery, we usually will put you back on the same medication. If you have a history of having blood clots, we will usually use a stronger prescription medication to prevent blood clots from reoccurring. And if you have no history of blood clots and are low risk, often your physician will use one full strength buffered aspirin given to you by mouth either once a day or twice a day to prevent blood clots after surgery. We also use sequential compression devices, which is a mechanical device that mimics walking as we rest. The device gently squeezes at the back of the calf to help keep blood flow going, which mechanically prevents blood clots from forming after surgery. Remember 3030. You will wear your sequential compression device anytime you are going to rest more than 30 minutes for 30 days. The more active you get, the less you will be wearing your device, but you will wear it to bed at night and again anytime that you're going to rest more than 30 minutes. Please be safe and take your medication and wear your device as prescribed. Another important piece of equipment that we send home with you is your incentive spirometer. Incentive spirometers are used to help us inflate our lungs and prevent pneumonia. Often they're overlooked, but the medications that we use with and after surgery can make us more sleepy, and often we don't take the big breaths that we need to. If you're running a low-grade fever, your incentive spirometer is often the first thing that your nurse reaches for. Please use your incentive spirometers at home four to six times an hour when you're awake. We will teach you how to use it in the hospital. Keep it close by when you're sitting at home and use it as directed. If you have had a total hip replacement, your doctor will place a waterproof bandage on your hip at the time of surgery. This dressing is called an Aquacel AG dressing. It is good for up to 14 days. It is placed on your hip sterilely in the OR and is antimicrobial to prevent bacterial growth. It wicks to take moisture away from your incision. And again, it's waterproof, so you may shower with it. You will not remove your Aquacel dressing. Either your home health nurse will remove it or your physician will remove it 12 to 14 days after surgery. If you have had a knee replacement surgery, you will have a pressure dressing on for the first evening. That pressure dressing is somewhat bulky, but helps prevent swelling and decreased bleeding. Before you go home, we will place an Aquacel AG dressing on your knee, which again will be left on until the nurse or physician takes it off on the 12th to 14th postoperative day. You may shower with your waterproof dressing. Let's talk about discharge planning. Once you have met your goals, we're ready to leave the hospital. The majority of patients will go home. Home may be home and right to outpatient therapy, which will be an outpatient therapy of your choice, or it may mean home with a home health nurse and therapist to come to the house. If we have advised home health, we will set it up for you. The nurse will come out several times a week and often does staple and dressing removal on the 12th postoperative day and the physical therapist will come three times a week for two weeks. If you are not meeting your goals in the hospital and we feel you are not safe to go home, then we will recommend rehabilitation. A rehab, either subacute or acute, mean that you go and you stay for a period of time. They're goal oriented as well. Most patients who go to subacute rehab are there for 11 to 14 days. Acute rehab is usually recommended for patients that have more than one joint replacement at a time. There are no acute rehabs in Harford County, but there are several in Baltimore County and in Southern PA. We will discuss these options with you and usually have talked to you about them prior to surgery. Going to a rehab must be recommended by the physical therapist. If you have no one to stay with you at home, please contact me so we can discuss your plan of care. Your insurance 
does break it down between skilled therapy and custodial needs, meaning living alone is not a reason to go to a subacute or an acute rehab. Rather, we can postpone your surgery until such a time as you can find someone to come and stay with you for a few days and we can set up home health for you as directed. We highly encourage you, if you are safe, to go home and have the assistance of friends and family for the first few days until you are more independent. We would set up any home health needs and equipment needs that you have. When to call your doctor. You will call your home health nurse or doctor before your visit if you have any fever or if you have excessive drainage from your incision or if you notice tenderness in the calf of your leg. If you do have tenderness in the calf of your leg, please do not rub your leg. If you were to have a blood clot, rubbing your calf could release the blood clot into your system. Nine times out of 10, it isn't a blood clot, but a pulled muscle, but we would rather be safe than sorry. So anytime there is tenderness in the calf, you will want to notify us immediately. After you go home after surgery, if you have not gone directly to outpatient therapy, the home therapist will guide you to outpatient therapy nearing the end of your two weeks. The therapist will remind you to call and make an appointment with the outpatient therapy of your choice and they will call us to send an order to that outpatient therapy. Therapy is essential for your recovery and for the advancement of your joint replacement. Range of motion is a term you may hear frequently, especially with knee replacement surgery. We want our knee replacement surgeries to be able to bend greater than 110 to 120 degrees and straighten their leg all the way out. This will allow for doing stairs, riding a bike, and the normal activities you will want to resume. The only way to make this goal is by doing your therapy. We will send you home with exercises in the back of your book. I encourage you to do these exercises twice a day, every day. They strengthen your supportive muscles and they work on your range of motion. If you have gone to physical therapy that day, that can count as one of the two sessions. But please, don't skimp on your physical therapy. This will allow for the best result in your joint replacement. For any questions or concerns, please contact me directly. My number is 443-643-2663. That's the bone line, B-O-N-E, 2663. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting you after your joint replacement.